Hello, <laughs> welcome to Boxworks. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, this is a co-working space. Tonight I'm going to be a GPR compliant. Um, it's the, the thing we're all scared about that's coming soon. So our next speaker is Mark Ogilvy, is co-founder of Parola, a cloud-based payroll and expense, expense management software service. Now, payroll is something which is ubiquitous to all companies. Everybody does it. Um, and I'm here to tell you there's a few things that you need to be aware about it. Um, this system that I've written and we're using is founded on privacy by design, which was talked about earlier on as well. Uh, fortunately, we were lucky enough to start writing the software after GDPR was announced, so what we've been writing has been including facets of that as we go. I'm going to take you through what's collected and stored in a typical payroll, um, how that information gets transferred between your employees, your internal payroll people, um, and then into a, a company that might process it for you. Uh, data protection impact assessments. Now, every payroll, most payrolls, pretty much contain sensitive data. Uh, you probably contain or collect information on people's medical uh, history. If they submit for a sick leave and they give you a doctor's certificate, uh, that's medical history. If you've got something on somebody's trade union membership, that's also politically sensitive data. Um, if you've got their date of birth, their bank details, their uh, payment advice, all that sort of stuff is sensitive data. So we get into the realm now where you start having to do well, detailed data protection impact assessments uh, for what you contain and how you use it. The consequence of loss is also a significant uh, factor in the assessment of data protection. Um, if I ran a bubblegum factory and I collected information on what flavour of bubblegum was your preference, if that got hacked, I wouldn't be so concerned about it. Um, if I've got your bank account details, that's a little bit more serious. So you need to be able to assess what your level of risk is and then implement some mitigation measures that are reasonable. Now, we're not asking or we're not proposing that you go with military grade encryption and start uh, keeping everything in special black boxes, but you need to have proven that you've done some sort of reasonable measure of, uh, I guess, uh, protection of your data subject's data. Then I'm going to take you through documentation and maintenance. It's an ongoing process. It happens all the time. Uh, now, I can go the business manager route or the techie route. So this time I do want some hands up, please. If you're here from a business management perspective, hands up. If you're from a technical uh, data management perspective, okay, so we're more towards the business management side. When I started writing Parola, um, I decided that my privacy by design process was to get the sensitive data right down to the people who are going to write the code. So I wanted every piece of information we're putting in the database to be uh, assessed as it goes on. So this is a snapshot of my database. Um, abstraction layer. But basically, I collect all the information and I write the reasons that we've been talking about in the first slide. So this here, on IBAN is part of your bank account. Uh, first line is I've got what it is. Second is, is it sensitive information? Yes. Next line, is it encrypted? Yes, it's encrypted. Third line, how did I achieve this or receive this method of information? Was it directly given by a customer or did it harvest somewhere else? In this case, it was given by an employee. What risk this information has. Um, it's identifiable by it. I can use it to identify a third party, I can identify it to um, access people's bank account information, so it's reasonably sensitive. Provided by who? The employer, the employer. Uh, the purpose for? Well, why do I keep it? Why do I need this information? It's used to pay employees, it's pretty self-evident. Um, how long should I keep it for? The retention period. Now, under the revenue, it's six years, so that's my easy method for, um, for determining compliance. Then I've got a couple of extra fields. How did I receive this data? Did it come by post? Did it come by carrier pigeon? Was it fax? Um, did it come from a web form? What sort of levels of protection did I place on how I received that data? Did I just leave it sitting outside in the post box where somebody could actually take it? Or did I have a encryption on a form of transfer? And going backwards, when I commit this data back to employees, how do I protect it as well? So again, encryption um, or uh, electronic transfer. So this bit of information sits at the heart of our code and everybody who goes to modify the database or to put more information in has to go through these assessments of whether or not the piece of information they need is actually relevant. Um, 
So that's the information we collect. The next one we want to know is how we flow this information through an organization. Where it comes from a customer, from a staff member, through to a data processor, through data controllers. You can ignore most of that. Um, this is basically our server architecture diagram. Uh, and it's how I keep track of what I have secure information via encryption or where I locate servers so that they're physically proximity located together. Uh, they might have physical security measures like they're hosted in a data center in Dublin which has tier one status, it's got um, access control, you know, it's, it's locked down, it's not kept in a shoebox at the back of your office. Now, I've assessed what data I had, what I use it for, why I keep it, how long I keep it for. The data protection impact assessment is a formalized process of looking at what you're keeping, what the risk to the data subject is, and how you might mitigate that risk. There's a fantastic tool um, which was produced by CNILF, it's part of the uh, French uh, agencies, and it's a downloadable open source tool for preparing data protection impact assessments that then you can submit to your data protection commissioner in your relevant country. Fantastic bit of our software, um, and it's what we've done our impact assessment on as well. So that's take the note down the bottom there, so it's brilliant. So, what we implemented as a result of our data protection impact assessment. Now, if we start at the, the top left here, uh, segregation of concerns. Basically, I split up everything that um, doesn't need to be located together. So I don't store my database information on the same servers as the software. I don't keep it on the same servers as the backup systems. Um, everything is sort of separated so that I can put proper security measures between those uh, bits of service. I encrypt our servers, so you've got to get passwords to get in there. If somebody takes the Blade server, they can't get into it anyway. Um, secure inter-server comms, so the communication between servers is also encrypted. Uh, there's no man in the middle attacks where somebody can intercept the transmissions between. Now, just to give you a bit of guidance, blue start items are things that I consider I've implemented which is additional to what would have been business as usual before GDPR. So if it's got a blue star next to it, that's probably going above what you would have uh, done in the past. So host selection, um, this refers to our service provider, which was uh, ServerGrove. They were based in Dublin. Um, big organization, they notified me two weeks ago that they're moving to Miami. GDPR was too big a beast for them, um, and they're just getting out of dodge. So I'm in the process of transferring all of our data and servers over to another Dublin-based provider. Um, Firewalls, that's a, a usual thing, it's making sure only the right people get into the right servers. IP whitelists, that's one step further, saying that I know exactly who is getting into my servers and I won't let anybody else in. Um, security certificates, that's that little green symbol you see on the web browser as you're clicking on a page, that means that your address is known and that the information transmitted between your browser and our servers is encrypted as well. Um, access control lists, so making sure that your staff have the right security privileges to view their information. But they can't accidentally view somebody else's information. Um, that what you have on your website is only restricted to your stuff, can't be seen anywhere else. Now, it sounds straightforward. Um, it's not. You need to make sure that the authentication, the authentication and the approvals are kept up to date. So the manager of the business needs to keep on top of who has authority to enter those accounts. That's an ongoing issue. Encrypted personal data, so all that stuff about um, financial information and the additional uh, highly sensitive stuff, we then encrypt that again. So within the encrypted database there's another level of encryption and that gets uh, changed and converted when it comes back out again. So next one is privacy timeouts. Uh, if you've got a screen which has somebody's seller information on it, you don't want that just left displayed when you go off for a tea break. Uh, so after 40 seconds, the, the screen will go blank and things disappear. Next to above that is idle logs. So if you walk away from the computer after 15 minutes, it shuts down. So nobody can just hit a button and get back into the information. Um, encrypted output files. So when you get a PDF which has your pay slip on it, that's also got a password on it. So if somebody was sitting at your account, on your email account, they couldn't just open that up. And say uh, your partner was wanting to know how much you were paid and uh, where you got a bonus that year. They can't just open that up. Um, then, this is another couple of interesting things here. With the requirement for reporting data breaches under GDPR, the first thing you need to do is know that you've had a data breach. Um, how do you detect that somebody has been on your system unlawfully or 
without um, your approval. So there's a lot more logging that goes on. You have to transact every transaction. You start tracking who it was, why they went there, when they went there, and so that forensically you can go backwards in time if you do have a breach and say these were the people that were affected and uh, these are the people that I notified within 72 hours. Um, then breach reports, they go out, inquire and response. How does your payroll system or how does your payroll process deal with somebody asking um, what were they paid three years ago? Uh, did you account for sick leave on the state? Um, so there needs to be a way of uh, getting that information out. Now we've chosen to go with an employee self-service system where they can log on and that gives you all your power back to the employees. Um, but it's the process that's there which is part of GDPR requirements. So then you've got inquiry and response, how you formally deal with those requests for information. Um, portability and transfer. Now we started talking about that in the previous presentation. There's a require on data processes now that if you changed software providers, um, you should be able to ask me to give you all of your payroll information in one easy machine readable format and they can give it to the next person that they want to use. That format doesn't exist yet. Nobody has got together and agreed on a format for a transfer of payroll information. So at the moment that's still very manual um, and we're probably we're going to be doing it in Excel and comma files at the moment, but it's better than what's currently happening. Data expiry. Uh, Again, the, the six years makes it quite simple from a payroll perspective, it's regulatory, but every month you have to go through and make sure that that piece of data that you've kept hasn't expired. Then what do you do with it when it expires? Do you want to delete it? Do you want to amortize it? Do you want to convert it to a fake value? Do you want to put it in the peer group so you might have somebody's date of birth? Uh, instead of getting rid of the data, you could just say that person was born in the 1970s or the 1980s. Um, however you want to anonymise the data, that's the process you go through. The next one for us, which we still haven't got a head around, is backup cleansing. So we run uh, backups of our databases and our servers, which is great. We do it daily, we do it weekly, and then we've got another one monthly. Uh, if somebody comes along and says, I want my data deleted, how do I get rid of it? That would technically require me to go back through all the old databases, bring them up live again, and then search for the piece of information, delete it, and then re-archive the database. Um, backup cleansing is a problem for me, and I haven't figured out how I'm going to resolve that yet, but it's a work in progress. Um, and then the next one is anonymization or pseudo-anonymization, which is, it's, I guess, the nuclear option where you just decide not to know anything about the person. You keep a separate file which contains the bare minimum that you need, and then any information between their actual data and that separate file is anonymized. And um, again, that's a, it's a big process from a programming perspective. When I started doing this, uh, would have been two years ago, there was very little in the way of GDPR tools about it. So we started writing our own documents and our own processes. We keep this um, on GitHub, which is a version control system. Um, the beauty of that is that any change to the document is recorded and uh, timestamped. So it's, it's a living document that actually <laughs> uses part of our privacy policies and describes to our staff how we run the business and how we protect the subject matter's data. Um, version control is great, I, I recommend that for everybody as well. Going forward, how do you actually maintain the data? Well, you've got to go through the regular expiry of data, which I talked about earlier. Everything you do from the point onwards of your initial setup uh, has to have its own protection impact assessment. So if I came through in six months time, actually, here's a good example, in eight months time I'm going to start rewriting the database for PAWE modernization. That's a new initiative coming out of revenue uh, January 19. So that rewrite process has its own data protection impact assessment. Again, looking for the data that we're storing and how we're going to uh, minimise its risk of exposure. Monitoring logs I spoke about, you've got to keep on top of them. Uh, we have scheduled weekly review of the logs. Uh, report breaches, again, you need to notify quickly, so that's an ongoing process. Responding to requests for information and transfers, again, that can happen at any time um, and you don't know when. There's also a requirement to report to the board. So this is a senior level of representation that your data protection officer um, has. They're, they're right up there at C-suite level. So it's a serious undertaking and a serious commitment from the business to actually listen to the needs of the data protection officer. Um, and the last one is to audit and monitor. 
you've got these systems in place, how do you know they're working effectively? How do you know that they're actually um, providing your customers and your data subjects with the level of protection that they're entitled to under GDPR? So that's mine, I've kept that pretty brief. Um, it is very relevant to nearly all companies in Ireland that pay people, uh, that you've got sensitive information. So it's, it's a little bit scary at this point in time because I know there's a lot of boxes of um, shoe, full, shoe boxes full of uh, pay slips and people's old uh, records of, um, of trade union receipts and all that sort of stuff. And that is all highly critical data. So a bit of spring cleaning is probably in order for most companies. Thank you. My name is Hilary Coffin and I'm um, located here in Boxer, so my business is Triangle Marketing. I'd like to introduce to, to my co-working colleagues um, Natalie Carlin Cook from uh, Natalie Cook Consulting and Alan McKenna from two companies. Alan wears two hats actually, he's from a company called Servit, his own business, and he's also working with um, Mary at Fort Privacy. So, um, so we're going to talk about um, GDPR from a practical point of view um, and just uh, take you through a case study that we've kind of, well we have put together here in, in Boxworks. So, um, just talking about GDPR, I mean after the two presenters that we've had, are we all fully up to date with GDPR and all pretty gung-ho? <laughs> I know this was me a few months ago anyway, um, kind of my head was in the sand a bit about it, but um, but sure look, we love it now and we'll just take it as it comes and deal with it as it is. So. Um, so just um, just talking about our case study, really. Um, I suppose just what we're going to talk about is the background and how we how we arrived here today, not in Boxworks, but how we got to this stage with, with uh, standing up here in Boxworks talking to, um, and go through the plan as well of what, how we implemented GDPR um, and the challenges. But there are many challenges, and we've all heard about um, the amount of information that GDPR has. Um, and the challenge is really for small businesses from um, information to application. And then we're going to talk about the outcome, which is ongoing. <laughs> so really, so um, just a little bit about the background. Um, Natalie and I are, sort of in, are in businesses that are complementary to each other. Natalie's a GDPR, oh, GDPR expert. <laughs> Natalie's a CRM um, expert. Um, and she works with businesses on, on uh, helping them to, like, to improve their processes. I work as a, a, a design strategist with, um, in marketing and service design, and I work with people. So um, both of us together have kind of, um, we complement each other's businesses. Um, but I suppose with that in mind, for the last two years or a year and a half anyway, we've been on the circuit going to networking events and event, information events, a bit like this actually gathering information, reading up about it, talking to people about GDPR and the application and the implication for our businesses. So, um, a few months ago, I'm getting nervous here now, <laughs> I'm just stop and breathe. Um, so a few months ago, Waterford Micro Business Network set up um, another information evening. This is about the eighth one that I've been to. Um, and it was an excellent um, presentation. It was for small and micro businesses. Um, it was delivered by a guy called Seamus Hayes, and he went through the whole process, a bit like what we've had here this evening, but it was specifically for small businesses. Um, and I was sitting in the room over at the library, and I was among all other small businesses, and, uh, and Ashley was there, Alan was there, um, Victoria was there, some, some of the uh, small businesses are here in the audience, Joyce and Carmel. So we were all in, in the library over there, and there was a sort of an overwhelming feeling in the room. And Seamus was doing his best now to kind of say, you know, if you do it step by step, you'll get there. So I was sitting there and I was thinking, here we go again, rational other information evening. I'm two years now into GDPR at this stage and I've done nothing about it in my business. So what can we do really to, um, to help each other out? And two things was, one is that GDPR is really about people. So it's about people who entrust us in our businesses with their information, with their data. And the second part that kind of hit me was that GDPR is about the people who process that data, who are responsible to control that data and what they do with it. And I looked around the room that evening when we were on the way out, I said to Noah, um, you know what we should do now? We should sit down together up in boxers, get some businesses together and work through it ourselves. Let's kind of like start at the very beginning and work through it and develop our, be compliant by the 25th of, of May. So of course, Nat, 
as, as Natalie does, you know, she's a bit like Nike, she just says, let's do it, we just do it, you know. So before we actually left the library, four businesses on board. <laughs> so, um, and we came back to Boxworks and we put it into place, really. So our plan was, our goal is really that by the 25th of May, a number of small businesses would be compliant. We would have the documents, we would have our policies in place, we would have our understanding of data, and more importantly, we would be ready if there's an if if our businesses were going to be um, there's a breach. What would we do for that? How would we protect our data? Um, and also, what were we going to you know if, if somebody approached us to be able to give them back their data or to give them the information that we were holding on? That's really really important. Um, and so we kind of. So we, we put together the workshops anyway, um, and our, our plan was really to create workable GDPR solutions that were appropriate for small businesses. Um, we were to kind of look, I, I, that evening in that room over in the library, I was kind of saying, all these small businesses here, we have common denominators. There are parts of data, GDPR, that are data that we gather in our businesses that are common to all of us. And recognising that you know, every, every small business particularly is different. Um, we can surely work together to understand what these denominators are and identify what the, what the other issues are and work through them collaboratively. So um, another plan was really that we would inspire each other to, you know, motivate each other to keep going at it, keep going at it, and set, you know, through these workshops. So we had about, initially we had about 12 businesses involved or invited to come along. Um, this is a list of the businesses that, were, that are still with us. Some of them, due to work commitments, couldn't actually come to the workshop, so that's fine, we'll catch up with them again. Um, but here we are, we're all mostly small businesses, we're all different in, in the type of business that we, we're in on a daily basis. So we have Tucker, it's a fintech startup here, we've Justin Kearns here in the audience. Um, we go out to Joyce O'Carroll, Joyce, there she is, um, caricatures by Carmen. Carmen actually wears two hats. Um, so she runs a, a caricatures business, which is where she takes data from photographs of people and, and creates wonderful caricatures. Um, and she also runs an event business. And of course we have Emer from Boxworks. Where is she? My pal Emer. Hello. <laughs> um, and Natalie and myself from well, Natalie Girl Cook and Triangle Marketing. So, Alan. We looked at Alan and we said, right, the first thing we'll do is we'll put together a really good team around us. So who do we know that can help us? And in the true spirit of co-working, we knocked on Alan's door and I went to his office, his, his desk down, just down from me, and said, Alan, you know what, we're really, if we, if we put this together and we have some questions, will you, um, is there any chance you might answer them for us? So of course he said, you know, the gentleman that he is, he said, look, I'll come and sit in the workshops. Great goal. That's that we've achieved a goal. So, um, so I'll just hand you over to Alan now to um, go through. Thank you. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, my role here this evening is very much a cameo role. I won't keep you long. One slide. Um, it's great to see such a turnout here, and thank you to our first two, uh, two speakers for really lifting a bit of the fog, I hope, for a few of us in the room around GDPR. Um, it's great to see someone here tonight in what I can only assume is a backslapping exercise in compliance that we're all ready for the 25th of May. Fantastic. Um, but if we're not, I think some of the advice here tonight has been, has been great, and we can go home and, and start applying it. Um, as I said, my name is Alan. I'm a data protection officer with Fort Privacy. I have a development background, and I'm based here in Boxworks since January of this year. And um, since since arriving here, it's it's been really great to see the collaborative environment that that is Boxworks. We have many small businesses here, all collaborating with each other and connected into the wider business community in Waterford. So, you know, what starts here really spreads out a lot further. <clears throat> and as Hilary said, um, GDPR was on the radar. Hilary came to me and, and said, well, what do small businesses have to think about when it comes to GDPR? Because, you know, there's obviously a, a lot of a big organizations have been planning for a long time for this, but small businesses, you know, really don't have the capacity or band bandwidth to, uh, to pay attention to this, and maybe until we're here now. Um, and what I would say about that is that it can seem quite daunting from the outset. 
to small businesses, but it is important to keep it in perspective that the challenge is often is often relative to the to the size and the scale of what you do, the amount of personal data that you handle within your business, the types of personal data, how sensitive it is, and what type of individuals do you deal with in your business. As Mark was was pointing out, there are certain certain sensitive categories of data. You know, do you deal with vulnerable subjects as well? You move into a higher order of protection that you need to be concerned with. GDPR is about delivering on people's rights to privacy. In, in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights for Citizens, it's, it, the, the, art, the article in there is the right to the protection of your personal data. And GDPR is about realizing that right in law, harmonized across the EU. Many businesses are familiar with the concept of health and safety. It's an ongoing exercise. GDPR is very much health and safety for data, and it's an ongoing exercise. We need to monitor, review, and as our business evolves and changes in how we collect and process information, we need to take checkpoints along the way. People, processes, and systems all play a key part in this. People are very much at the, at the heart and soul of it, though. People are, people are, are responsible for developing those processes, for you know, ensuring that the systems and third parties that we, that we actually use in our businesses are responsible and process data how we, are, how we uh, agree with them in contract. And people are, 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 people are who we're protecting as well. So with that being said, I'm gonna hand you back to Hillary, as I said, very short, and she's gonna step you through a bit of the workshop that we did here. Oh, Natalie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, can anyone relate to that? The long finger. So that was me with DTPR. <laughs> now, it's hilarious because as Hillary said, I have known about GDPR for the last couple of years. I'm a CRM specialist and of course CRM collects data of personal information. Um, and yet still that long finger came out and I must do something and went to loads of workshops and you know when anytime I saw something on GDPR I'd be there put it on the long finger right next one gonna you know definitely definitely gonna set some time away now and really do this and write my own privacy policy and my my policy statement and again long finger and then it really just before Christmas we, we met Alan just after Christmas, wasn't it? So we joined and it was still life and work getting in the way. And um, then the wonderful WMBN, which we're, we're a good few of us are members of, did this workshop and really that's when it started. And when Hillary said to me, well, we, need, we should do something together, I was, yes, let's do this. And really that's how it started. Um, within a week, we had emails out and the lovely room here in box where it booked and everyone ready to come on board. And the first workshop we did really was, we, we now Alan, the poor Alan was like for the first couple of hours, just we just drilled him with questions. Um, but yeah, so we, I mean, Hillary really drove this, not myself, but it was, it was, it was really a great process to go through. And to discuss even what is data, what is personal data? We, we, uh, Mari has gone through a lot of that today, so it won't bore you, but, you know, we found a really good checklist online, which really helped us. We sort of had that in front of us, um, and just even learning about the categories of personal data. So things like, well, yeah, we deal with clients, we deal with prospects, we deal with suppliers, we deal with resources. Some of people deal with shareholders, employees, subcontractors. And then within each of those categories, we were able to individually, as small businesses, sit there and decide, well, within each category, what do we collect? So some of us collected more data than others. So obviously, as Maria mentioned, name, address, email, phone number. Some of us collect bank details. 
that's a bit more worrying. Um, purchase history, images, videos, birthdays, anniversaries. So, you know, all of a sudden you're thinking, ah, oh, mine's only a small business, I'm grand, you know. But then when you actually really start breaking down what information you're holding on other people. Um, yeah, so one of the good things we learned this day, and Alan really helped us, was what data controller or a data processor. And what we found out was as small businesses, most of the time we're both data controller and a data processor. What are cookies? <laughs> I still don't really know. I, I've known about it for years, but you know, why do I need a cookie policy? I mean, a tiny little website, you know? Um, I was like, no, I don't need one. And the lads were like, you do. I'm like, no, I don't. I have a tiny little website. I don't use cookies. They checked for me. 14 cookies on my website in the background. So yeah, so it, it's all good. And what was lovely was we were there supporting each other. And as we were, we had our laptops typing away and help, helping build our policy. So we came back a couple of uh, weeks later and we found a really great template um, that then Hillary really sort of shared with us all. And um, that kind of was, for me, the start of right, I've got a handle of this now, that I'm not, I'm not petrified anymore of this thing. Um, I'm not putting on the long finger. And the template really was step-by-step -step thinking of every different bit of process within the business. And then with the checklist that we'd done the, 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 um, the couple of weeks before, we were able to really build specifically our own. Um, yeah, so I mean, for me, that's really where it was, learning about contract and consent and legitimate interest and emails and all these things that you're like, oh, <laughs> don't want to know. But actually now, for me, I actually have a GDPR statement, privacy policy on my website, cookie policy. Um, it's a work in progress, as has been mentioned, it's never going to be over. I learned this week about anti. I need to add antivirus software into that because I use that on my. Um, I didn't realise that. So it is a work in progress, but I'm no longer daunted by it. And I think here maybe a lot of us could help each other out, and just support each other with not making it too daunting. Maybe we can't afford to get take somebody in and you know spend a good few hundred euro on on somebody I mean, bigger companies i would definitely say yes you need just get somebody in to do it for you but for us small companies we maybe can't do that so let's support each other and help each other myself and hillary are definitely here to help you all Thanks, and alan <laughs> So just some of the business challenges that we found going through the process was the biggest one really is about getting rid of data. So it was a bit like the weather spoon at the moment, do we keep, do we let go or what? Um, so um, that's, that's really one of the hardest parts. And if you're like me, a bit of a hoarder, I've stuff since I probably left school 100 years ago. Um, you know, it's, it really was a hard thing for me to do to actually get rid of stuff. And we live in an internet, you know, the internet, the age of the internet. You know, there's a lot of information out there really, really, it's, it's a cost. <coughs> to hold any information that we, is no longer valid for our business, just in case. Um, so the other things that we came across were like defining the third party relationship. So where we had, where we're using um, systems or connect other systems, third party to our own business. What we found a couple of weeks ago was that some companies didn't actually have their policies in place, so they're all kicking in now, we're all getting emails from them. So that's only, that's kind of, everybody's waking up to it now. Um, and really one of the, the hardest part, and I've only a small business, um, is like, what sort of data does my business really need to hold? And I'm very, very streamlined in what I'm keeping. I don't want stuff that, you know, if, if I ever have a breach, which I'm taking all the steps to prevent that, um, I don't want me holding information that's going to harm somebody down the line. So, you know, I'm, I'm very serious about it. Um, and, I, and I am very kind of passionate about that because for me, the most important thing for me is that I protect my customers, that I protect the people who, who trust me with their data. Um, so these are just some of the resources that we found um, online. This was a really, really useful document for us. It's published by the uh, Data, Pro data Protection Authority in Ireland, is that their name? Yeah. I still don't know their name, but anyway, it's available online, it's, it's a great document. It basically goes through the different stages that Nat spoke about. Um, and you can actually download it and edit it to, to suit your own business needs. 
However, we also have Lovely Allen, who produced um, a great trail board for us in response to us having a conversation. He also produced a, he wrote a blog as well. Um, and this is actually available on um, serveit.com from Alan. So if any of you haven't yet started the process, and I, I don't know if any of you have, but this is available for you as well. I suggest you check it. So just, just to sum up then, the outcome of what we've gone through. So definitely from my point of view, I've, I've changed my mindset. This whole process has changed my mindset from, oh my God, I'll have so much work to do. It's all about me, and where am I going to find the time and stuff? So now I've, I've changed it to an outward look. So I'm looking, my focus is, is, is on the people who interact with me on a, on a daily basis. Um, it's also helping me to increase my efficiency. I have systems in place and of audits, you know, so I'm ready for an audit and if people want access to, to their data, I can provide that for them. Well, not quite yet, but just a couple of weeks I'll be happy. But really important to me is the brand trust that, I, um, that we all as a group actually are building for our clients and our businesses. Um, we, we're very much about transparency, you know, having information and more transparency. But and another another huge advantage for small business or any business really is your competitive advantage. You know, if you're pitching for work and you're looking for work from other businesses, you know, it's a huge advantage to be able to say to them, I am GDPR compliant as much as I can be. And that's especially if you're in the business of tendering, that's huge. So for us really another outcome is that the document that's documents that we're creating, it's a live document. It's it's ongoing. It's not going to change, you know, when the twenty fifth of May comes in and we're opening champagne because we've we've done we've reached it and we're all in one piece um, and still in business. It's not about that. It's about you know it's about something that will grow and change with any changes that are occur with our business like a new software firm or, or new clients and so on. So the other thing that's really, really important for me is that, um, and for all of us really, GDPR is now part and parcel of the DNA of our businesses. So it's designed into our businesses. So it's from the very beginning of any new services that we're providing, to, um, GDPR is sewn into that. So, um, and another thing to say, really, the last thing that I don't want to play anymore after this is, um, this is a quote from Helen Keller, and she's a woman in American political uh, woman who had faced huge challenges in her life. But one of her, things, her quotes were, alone we can do so much, but together we can do so much more. And that really sums up our co um, collaboration here about GDPR in, in Boxwork. So thank you very much. It just goes to show exactly what can be done when you come together and the three guys just demonstrated what Boxworks is all about. So well done, fantastic. So listen, we'll open the floor to some questions. Also, we have Sean Boyle here, he's a barrister of law, so if anyone has any leading questions, is it okay to have our business emails on our mobile phone? I think that means I have to answer that one. Yeah. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, and the long answer is yes, but you need to make sure that you have good security processes around that. So I mean, the reality of life is that we all, we how we work with data and how we work has changed so much over the last 20, 25 years. Um, and we're very mobile now, and I think it's okay. Um, but I would say that you need to look at what, ha what happens when I lose that mobile phone and I'm prepared to be able to remote wipe it. Have I got the right security? Have I got password protection on my phone? Have I encrypted? A lot of businesses will make sure that they encrypt any business emails that are on personal devices. Um, but you know they might you might not encrypt everything else on your phone, but you might encrypt that piece. So there's yes, but with caveats. Thank you. Yeah. For March uh, next year, I'll be um, anyone dealing with British companies are they subject to GDPR after March? For uh, Brexit, is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, right. Actually, possibly the barrister might be better to um, respond on the Brexit question. <laughs> My view actually would be that the regulation it, it depends on the citizen. Any EU citizen generally should be covered by the regulation. Uh, that's how I read it. Uh, so I would thought it depends on the issue of the point of view from the point of view of the person who's starting or talking about it as opposed to the geographical location, the person who's processing the data. That, that's how I see it. Uh, actually, the first issue about the mobile phone, 
I think the general, my general philosophy of life is that you hope for the best but prepare for the worst. Yes. Um, and I think that definitely applies to this. And, and one of the things I can say is the, uh, the analogy of the health and safety, so some of you may have these torturous safety statements that you have to prepare in workplaces and the health and safety authority to make your life hell. But I can tell you that if there's a workplace accident and I'm involved in suing the workplace, one of the first things you look for is the safety statement. So if you're the subject of litigation involving privacy breach, one of the first things that we will be looking for is how do you comply with this legislation. So even though it is going to be torture, it's it's well worth listening to what these guys have said. Uh, obviously all they do when you move Just to add to the Brexit question, um, what I what I say is I I think that there's gonna be regulatory alignment in the UK because they do business with the EU and anyone who does business with the EU citizens has has to comply with these obligations. Yeah, the UK. To herself in a moment. But um, something else worth noting um, with Brexit is the UK obviously will be out of the EU at, at that point and will be considered under GDPR as a third country. Um, and what that means for data transfers is that there is no, there's currently no mechanism in place to. Um, to have compliance data transfer between the EU and the, 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 uh, and the UK. Um, so, like for example, with the US, there's Privacy Shield, and um, there's about 13 other countries that have been given adequacy decisions, but the UK has, uh, the, the, the EU Commission um, has actually said that the UK is not guaranteed this after Brexit. They will have to meet sort of requirements to, get, to, 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 to be awarded that status. And so having your data in the UK, business need confidence. You know, businesses operate on, 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 on knowing what's going to happen. And that is a great, quite a bit of a question mark at the moment. So if you have data in the UK, um, I think a lot of businesses, including banks, uh, are, have actually been looking at moving their stored data out of the UK because there's that question mark um, at the moment. So I think that, that, will, that will come into play. But I think the ICO in the UK, the, the Data Protection Office, is highly proactive and they're one of the best, one of the better data protection um, authorities out there. And they have indicated that the UK will be looking to be in full alignment with GDPR. Let's try this one. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Paul. It's been been very interesting and uh, you know, all kinds of information. If I remember half it, I'd be doing very well. But from a practical point of view, I'm just worried about emails. Uh, my computer is out of and it stores every email that I ever got in my life. And a lot of them have people's names, phone numbers, email addresses. What should I do? <laughs> Data retention policy. So, um, Maybe use Outlook 365, for example, um, or, okay. or Outlook itself, which you can likely set a retention policy on your emails, so to automatically scroll emails after a certain amount of time. Um, what I would be saying to people is going forward, don't be thinking of email as file storage. <laughs> if you have data that you think you're going to need, or, and certainly also have a basis to keep, stored in a more structured, uh, it comes in through your email, stored in a more structured format where it's easier to recall and easier to to place limits on the, the time that you keep it. So I would say any business should be putting data should be putting a retention policy on their email. Often that's just a setting in your software where you can say after a year um, get rid of an email that is beyond this time at this point. Um, uh, and if, if you have a reason to keep data beyond that time you shouldn't be keeping it in email. Uh, so it's about changing how you do business, little, little, these little tweaks. Okay, can I just follow on from that? Because I use a, is it a hosting company or something? Mm -hmm. They also have the emails. Now, I, the emails come to me on my computer, but they're also stored in this less host or hosting or whatever it is. They have as well. Yeah, and wherever you place your retention policy, ideally you, your outlook is connected to that 
post and it will, once you scrub your email from your Outlook, it should also sync the deletion with them. Yeah, it should. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you want to get off your supplier or your host their GDPR policies to make sure that they are back to back line with yours. Um, and also, they have the same issue with backups that I have. They, they keep all of your information and they back it up. Um, so, you want to know how they're going to deal with that. And when they tell you, can you tell me? If I find out. Let's also add that the GDPR um, you know, is, is practical as well. And like Mark was saying, you know, how do you deal with these backups that you know I have to restore and scrub certain data and make a backup from that? You know, there's a, 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 there, a, there is a point where it can be considered like excessive effort um, and, and beyond reasonable expectation that you'd be able to actually do these things. Yeah, depending on your resources, of course, if it's reasonable. It's reasonable. It's not when backups come into play. Uh, the key thing I think for me is. There needs to be retention policies on your backup. So if certainly somebody says, I want my data to be forgotten from everywhere that you have, at least you can guarantee that within X amount of months, it's going to fall into your data retention policies and it will be gone anyway. Um, and it's not easily accessible to anyone in the format that it is. Your backups are encrypted, for example, um, and, and they're, they're managed uh, like that. Mark, I'll just does my business need to appoint a data protection officer? Um, I'm probably not the person to ask on that. Um, <laughs> it's to do with the type of data you store and the volume you store. Yeah. So there's um, there's guidance from there's a there's if you're getting into trying to evaluate these kind of questions, um, you would be looking to the European um, Data Protection Supervisory Authority, and there's a group there called the Working Party Twenty Nine Group and they provide guidance on various things to do with GDPR. And so if you're looking at specific questions like that, there's two really good resources. One is the UK ICO, because they kind of translate a lot of that guidance into plain English. Um, and then there's the UK, I, uh, the, sorry, the Working Party 29 group who will issue guidances. And they've issued the guidance on data protection officers in terms of how to evaluate whether you need one. So if you're a public authority, um, if you're a public body, you absolutely have to have one. If you're a private company, then you need to assess whether you need to have one. And there, what you're doing is you're assessing um, the volume of data you're processing. So the number of data subjects you're dealing with, the type of data you're processing, how long you're processing the data, the geographical nature of the data, and uh, the sensitivity of the data. So, you know, if you're pr processing special categories. Um, and then you're, you're making an evaluation based on uh, the answers to those questions as to whether you fall into um, uh, needing to appoint a DPO or not. I would advise companies to do that assessment um, and record it and record your decision even if you decide not to appoint one because that's part of your you showing that you've thought about it is important even when you come to, you know, your, your answer is no at the end of the day. So. Okay, great, Mark. And just one other question. Do we have to go out and get a new consent from all our customers? So how many people have thought about this? Is this pertinent to a lot of people in the room or? Yeah, I see a lot of nods there. Um, so you certainly need to go and look at your legal basis for processing. Um, and in general, if, and it's not always definitive, but in general, if you're marketing, your marketing day space is probably, you're probably processing based on consent. You've gone out and you've asked people, um, can I have permission? Do, would you like to join my newsletter email list? Or, you know, um, can I have permission to market to you? Can I have permission to communicate with you? Um, in that case, if you are processing on consent, then you need to look and see if your consent is um, in line, was captured in line with the GDPR. And the GDPR says no opt in, no opt outs, always opt in. Um, a positive, it's an affirmative action that's required, no pre-ticked boxes. Um, and you also, you might, you might not have a very good record of what did the person consent to in the first case. Um, so you need to look at your consents and then there is, there is a window of opportunity to do reconsent. I think in reality most, if you haven't done it already, you've probably missed the window of opportunity because for just purely for the fact 
that we're getting emails on a daily basis at this stage? How many people are just getting emails in trying to reconsent on a daily basis? People are just getting burned out with those emails, they're ignoring them. And so really on a practical, on a practical sense, because people are going to ignore those emails, the window of opportunity has probably passed. <coughs> um, I'll just say um, that I noticed that you know there's there's a couple, there's a couple of ways that people, that companies are processing marketing uh, emails and electronic communications at the moment, and one is you know tick this box, we're going to send you this. That's that's valid consent. You have you've been doing that. You have it. You don't need to re-consent. And um, the other is the auto ticked box. By assuming that that's consent, it's not. You know you've you you defaulted somebody into marketing. Um, that's not valid consent under, under GDPR. People haven't taken an affirmative action to say, I, I consent to this. If that's how you collected it, that's not valid consent. You, you should ideally have taken an opportunity to reach out and try and, and get valid consent before um, GDPR comes into force. The other way that people are processing is not even having a, a box there when they're, when they're maybe buying a product, checking out from it. Uh, a, a card to e-commerce, <clears throat> e-commerce site or whatever, but just because you bought a product, you're added to this list, and you know you start getting emails, and um, that's not consent either. But but it is considered legitimate interest uh, processing if the person has bought, has a demonstrable demonstrable business relationship with you, and you are um, you are the communications with them involve products or services related to what they bought from you. So, a little niche there. But what the caveat, and we mentioned earlier about e-privacy coming down the road, e-privacy is very likely to actually get rid of that basis for electronic communications, and consent will be the higher order, the best way to process um, marketing-based communications. And so, if you assess that, oh, we're processing on legitimate interest, um, I wouldn't be confident that that's going to be valid in, in the near term even. And so it is ideal that you'll be moving toward consent, total con trans transparency. People know what they, that they are opting in and what they are opting in for. Consent is a higher order of process, of lawful basis. Okay. Uh, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Alan, with a question there. The question there. Just on the issue of consent, uh, the thing that surprises me about this is, for once, in my head, the lawyers actually have the simple answer in that. <laughs> Certainly, if you look at contract law, contract law has always been very simple on the issue of consent. It has to be full and informed. And that's a general principle to do with consent. So you have to know what you're consenting to. And it does strike me that one of the problems for people, particularly small businesses with the data tax regulation, and not if nobody here is told, everybody here, as far as I can see, is simplified. It's simplified because I've read the whole of the GDPR and I've read what, what some people here may not know also is there's the data protection bill coming up, which is going to have an, add an extra layer to the GDPR. I've read it and it doesn't make it any less complicated. Um, and it's not clear how it's going to play. But for me, consent is very simple. The person just has to know what they're consenting to. And I think the added, and, and if you just think about that logically, if you hide a little box away in reams and reams of text uh, to try and get their consent to something, even if it's not deliberate, it's just that you're trying to have it at the bottom of the page, the GDPR would say that's not consent. So it's about keeping it simple, telling them what they're consenting to and then asking them to make sure, and then only then ticking the box or pressing the button or whatever it is. And, and, and actually, just one other issue that isn't related to that, but the question was asked about the email. When it comes to Outlook 365, I can tell you that the entire law library system is now based on Outlook 365. You have 2,500 barristers, and we, do, we get medical records, we get everything, we get every single piece of sensitive data that you can think of, dates of birth, bank account numbers, everything you can think of, we get emails to us. And certainly the, uh, the law library is telling us that I've got 365 is GDPR compliant, so I can sort of uh, tell you that. <laughs> that, that's what I'm resting on anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, final question here, does this just relate to personal or what about business customers? 
I'll partially answer that. It does relate to business because it, it relates to any um, any bit, any information that can identify a, a person. The distinction between personal and business data is, for example, say you have an info at email address for a company or um, a general phone number. Doesn't relate to an individual. Doesn't fall in, into scope. And so you know, there's there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of people are using market, business marketing lists, for example, they might buy them in from people like Data Ireland, um, and uh, it's probably safer to be using only business contact details that don't identify an individual. That, if it doesn't identify an individual, it's not in scope. Mary, you might have something to add to that. However, it can be used with party data that could be used to identify an individual than it is. So if you're a one-person business, um, yeah. and you have an info at cheesefactory.com, um, then you're identifiable. So, yeah, it's very dependent on the case. I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, to what both the guys were saying, but I also, um, one of, I do I remember what I was going to say, actually. I We don't process very much personal data in, in, in our business as a result of you know, we, but we deal with a lot of very sensitive business information because um, because we're dealing with customers who are trying to be G GDPR compliant and we would be writing reports saying you're not compliant and you know, you don't really want that getting out into the, into the general public and stuff like that or here's what you need to do to be compliant. So we would deal with a lot of business information that would be very business sensitive. And to me, and we talk about drinking our own champagne when it comes to GDPR. So you know, our, and what we mean by that is, uh, that we need when we are going out giving advice to companies, we need to follow our own advice, um, and we're following our own advice with business data. And it, and and very much, I wanted to just kind of echo what Hillary said that really, from her presentation the positives that she pointed out about GDPR, about having processes in place, and the discipline that it forces on the business is actually really good for business. And an awful lot of businesses that we've worked with have said, actually, this is going to be, it's painful in the short term, but it's actually going to be really good for us in the long term. So from our point of view, we're putting similar processes in place that, to the ones that we're advising our customers to put in place. And we're seeing that it's bringing us business benefits as well. It's making us more efficient. It's making us more disciplined about how we handle the data. It's <coughs> we're carrying less risk as business, um, and it's really good to see somebody stand up from the small business community who's been through it and say, actually, this has helped our business too. Because I think if we embrace it and take a positive approach to it, it will be um, I, the the companies I work with that t embrace it and take a positive approach to it, I see them get so much more benefit out of it. Whereas if they kind of go, oh God, we have to do this, and they see it as a tick the box exercise, and they don't really kind of get into it, they 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 don't get as much out of it. Um, and so you know, I it's kind of feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, is the advice I would give. So that's a very long-winded answer to that question, but I, I do, it's lovely to see Hillary stand up and say it's helped the business too.